to ringside on a day where literally everyone in sport is reflecting on the tragic loss of cricketer Philip Hughes. Terrible news. Sport has its risks and its best, its, its great and its worst is uh, sadness and sometimes possible tragedies. Absolutely. Our guests Dave Colwell and Paul Smith are of course both saddened and both understand these situations. Dave, you've, you've almost been in a situation like this with Kieran Farrell, John Wilson, you had that worrying moment. It could have been life-threatening for both fighters. How did you approach that? It was, it was terrible. There's, there's no... We all love sport, we all love what we do. And you, with boxing, there's always that element of danger, you expect that. Um, but when it happens, it, you know, it's a real gut check and it's, it's, it's the lowest feeling that you can ever imagine. I can't imagine in a sport like cricket where we don't think of it as dangerous, we don't think of anything like this can happen. You know, it's, it's, it's terrible. 25 years old, same as James Murray all those years ago, and, and I remember how, how terrible that was at the time, obviously for the family. Also for Drew Doherty, the, the opponent, you know, having to, to go on, and, and sometimes they, they can't cope with that. Yeah, I said this today, and I saw someone tweeting about it, you know, the, the fellow who bowled the ball, you, you've got to worry about him as well. And, you know, Andy, Andy Crawler with Keenan Farrell, yeah. he, he, was, he wasn't the same for a long time after it and they were lucky, they, they, Keenan Farrell and Jerome Wilson made it through, but if you're a fighter and your wife gets a call after the fight, she's expecting the worst, if you're a cricketer and you get a call, you, your husband's been injured, you know, you're not expecting to hear the news what, what's happened today and that you know, goes out to him and his family, no one, no one, should, uh, no one should die competing in sport. Just very sad, isn't it? Mm. Mm. Your, your brother, your, your, your brother was knocked out on a on a, a car mm. that you were on. Mm. It must be very hard for you to concentrate and get on with the job itself. Yeah. I'm worried. It was. I didn't really want to go into it, but I was remember Dean Powell coming into me and saying, "Look, you need to be professional." Mick Williamson comes straight in after him and started putting grease on my eyes and saying, "Look, just think about the job. Think about the job." But it's easier said than done. You know, that was, that was me, me kid. But Drew was just being hurt and. I'd never seen him even put down like that, I'd never even seen him hit or rocked in my life, never mind caught the way he was and I knew he was tired and exhausted as well, so it wasn't a, it wasn't a nice feeling but, you know, it's it's life and that's sport, isn't it? And unfortunately sport can be big highs and big lows, as you said. So tough for family, friends, even reporters, Ed, when, when shocking news like this overrides everything else. Well, all contact sports carry risk and everyone competing is aware of it, but that knowledge does nothing to stop the shock and pain caused by any tragedy. My timeline's nearly 100% boxing, but today it's full of tweets showing respect to Philip Hughes from sportsmen and from supporters, including Amir Khan, a real cricket fan who put out this picture of himself with Hughes and teammate Michael Clark. Adam. Everyone reflecting, and on the day when we announce Amir Khan's return to Sky. Amir joins us from his American training base now. Firstly, Amir, we saw the picture of you with Philip Hughes. It's just a real tragedy, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, Philip was a good friend. And, um, you know, I, I remember meeting him in London. He was um, he was there for, uh, I think it was a test match. And we had a good chat, big boxing fan he was. And it's just a shame that, you know, at such a young age, he passed away, and our thoughts go out to him and his family. Yeah, thoughts do go out to him. Uh, Amir, um, back to business. You're back on Sky. Uh, it's not an easy challenge either, Demon Alexander. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be... I mean, it's great to be back on Sky again. It gives my viewers a chance to see me fight on there again. Um, yeah, you know, Demon Alexander's a great opponent for me. He's, uh, he's been up there. He's world-class. He's three-time world champion. Uh, it's it's going to be a tough fight. Um, but yeah, you know, we've been working really hard. I've been in training camp now for, it's been around about 11 to 12 weeks. I've been in San Francisco away from uh, my family and friends and everyone. I've been focusing on what I need to do. And yeah, I'm just looking forward to, to the fight at the MGM. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a huge fight for me. It's going to be a huge night for me because topping a bill at the MGM arena has always been my dream. You know, in Vegas. I mean, fighting in Vegas was my dream. But then it was to top the bill at the MGM and I'm the main star going there. You know, normally you get Floyd Mayweather who tops the bill there and fights at the MGM, but now it's going to be Amir Khan who's going to be going there. And I heard, I've been hearing from a lot of people, they've been sending me pictures on Twitter and stuff saying, well, we went to Vegas and we saw your picture all over the place. And I mean, it makes me happy because, you know, that's what, that, was my, that was my dream. When I started boxing, I wanted to be a big household name and want my picture on the strip of Vegas and stuff. And yeah, it's going really well. 
It is a dangerous fight, though, of course, because Devin Alexander, a two-weight champion, he's classy, he's, he's quick. He's got the speed a bit like you, hasn't he? He's, he's, he's got a very similar style, you know, because he's quick as well and explosive at times. Um, I think when it comes down to a skill, I think uh, my skills may be a little better than Devin's. I mean, but he's still a very skillful fighter. He's been in with the best fighters like Matisse, Marcus Maidana. He's been in a lot of big names. I mean, his last fight beat sort of cross. So he, he looked really good in his last fight as well. But look, uh, this is a fight I need uh, to get me to that next level. And, um, you know, we just have to go into, into this fight um, and box smart, stick to the game plan for, um, of our Virgil Hunter, who's been giving me a game plan to follow. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not cheating myself one bit. I mean, I'll be work, I've been working very hard with my strength conditioner, um, Tony Brady, as well. So when it comes down to fight night, we're going to be 100% ready. We're going to be fit and we, we're going to be stick to the game plan. We're not going to be making any mistakes. No doubt you'll be like us, fingers crossed, and hoping this will lead to a, a Mayweather fight or a big 2015. Definitely, you know, there's some big fights out there for me. I'm at that age now, I'm at my peak where, you know, I'm ready for those big fights and my name get mentioned uh, alongside the likes of Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao. And look, this fight can definitely lead to one of those big fights. And um, I think it's about time that we get those big fights in. Um, but yeah, it can only lead to the massive fights. It's a great card too as well, isn't it, with uh, Keith Thurman on and, and several others. It, it should be a fantastic night. The night's going to be amazing for boxing, yeah, because you've got uh, such a massive card. You've got so many big fights on that um, card. You've got Keith Thurman, who will be the undercard. Um, I, I think the Charlo, one of the Charlo brothers is still fighting on there. He, he was going to fight um, against Demetrius. But that fight I called off, but I heard he's still on the card. Also is Abdel Mahrez, I heard he's just come on the card. You've got Victor Ortiz on there as well. Uh, the main event is between me and Devin. So, so yeah, it's going to be a great card. It's going to be a great night for, for boxing fans to see the show and to see some good boxing. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks in Las Vegas. And uh, for now, happy Thanksgiving as well. Don't have too big a dinner out there. No, the way's not, been, the way's not too bad. So it's, it's okay. I'm going to just sit down with the family and we're going to have Thanksgiving dinner tonight. Um, I've got a training session in a few hours' time. But yeah, everything's going really well. We will see you all in Vegas, hopefully. Thanks, Amir. We look forward to that, don't we? At least the staff have turkey as well. Got to make the yeah. <laughs> Paul, listen, he's, he's got a, a tough one after the Colazo fight. You'd think he'd have a soft touch, but again, he's in even deeper water against Devin Alexander, a southpaw as well. Yeah, I, I think it's a tougher fight. I think what, what he's saying about hand speed, Devin is right, is correct. It's, it's someone who can not quite match him with hand speed. I don't think there's anyone around that can match him. He can't for hand speed. He's, he's blistered and he's rapid, but it's a, it's a quality fight, and if everyone's talking about the Mayweather fight, this is a massive test to take before that. You know, he has to impress, but he also has to not impress too much, otherwise he might not get <laughs> it anyway. And second southpaw makes a bit of an interesting point as well, because a lot of people are saying it could be a red herring Mayweather, it could be the mm. Pacquiao fight. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, they've said they've been promised the winner of Mayweather, they're talking Mayweather, Pacquiao. We don't know what's going to happen in 2015, we do know it's going to be big fights, but he's got a, a real test here, I think. The thing is, you know, Khan doesn't get all the credit that he deserves, you know, he, he could have picked a softer fight, but he looked great against Colazzo, and he wants, he wants Mayweather, he wants Pacquiao, he wants the big, big fights. In order to get the big, big fights, you've got to go out there, make a statement, impress against live apart opposition, and, and Devin Alexander is that. Speaking of Devin, uh, he, he's not a soft touch, as you said. Uh, he likes guys like Amir Khan that box him and don't rough him up. Yeah, because he's, he's a thinking fighter. Mm. Um, I don't know if he's, um, if he's got that inner steel about him, you know, um, he likes the technical fights and because I think technically he's a very, very good fighter and, and you know, a good, good brain. You're referring and, to the Bradley fight there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think once a fighter, once a fighter shows that, especially in a massive fight, which that was for yeah. them, you know, I think once they show that in that, that sort of level of fight, it's, um, it can come back and on again. Paul, I like the fact that he's really excited about sort of topping the bill at the MGM. He, he was at the Mandalay Bay when he fought Marcus Maidana. I mean, that was an absolute cracker, wasn't he? He thrives on this sort of occasion. He does, and listen, what he's saying about his dream, he's living every fighter's dream. Every fighter, myself included, would, would love to top the bill yeah. in Vegas in, in the MGM. You know, it's, it's, it's one of the biggest arenas there. It's possibly the biggest. It's about 17,000, 18,000 or something, isn't it? And, and 
the everything about the place when you're in Vegas. It's fight town, isn't it? You know, we, we, we've all been there for the fight and know what it's like and I give anything to fight then. What he's saying is right. He's living every kid's dream, so he'll love it, and I'm sure he'll thrive on it because he, he loves the big fights and the big occasions. From Vegas to Liverpool, we've got to talk Liverpool. Um, do you think the the criticism and the glory for for, for Tony is fair and just? <laughs> um, it's it's been a little bit disappointing, to be honest. I mean, I understand where everybody's coming from. Everybody was expecting a, a, a great war, you know, a tear up. But it takes two people to make a great fight. Two people to have a war. You know, you can't have a war on your own. You were obviously in Bellew's corner. What was Kev Cleverly's game plan? Do you think it, he just didn't want to get knocked out? Why was he just using one arm? I mean, even up close, he didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't really putting any purchase on his shots up up close. I mean, and you can't throw every shot as a bomb on the inside. You have to touch, touch, then pick the spot for, for you know to land the clean shots. But Cleverly wasn't really engaged. He didn't want to engage. He. he he just seemed to be happy to go the 12 rounds and, and get through it. But you told us that Barry was going to knock him out, come yeah, what may. We expect it to be a fight. We expected, listen, in a grudge fight, you expect both men to come out there throwing bombs because you don't like each other and you want to have a fight and you've got a lot of pride. You don't want to get beat by this man that's in front of you. Tony was like that. Tony was walking him down. He was the one that was trying to engage and wanting to, wanting to hurt him. But the other guy was walking around and, and, and flicking out a jab and not giving him them spots. And... You know, prospects have this set of problem when the fighting guys are in there just to survive, you know, and, and Tony had that same, same issue. Main event was disappointing. What stood out for you on the card? Obviously, your brother Callum, Anthony Joshua, Sizzle, James DeGale was good. What, what for you, Paul? I'll probably be a bit biased and say Callum for Boy, me. Your brother. Was, yeah, it was, was a disciplined <laughs> performance. It was 12 rounds again. Some, some people thought Callum bit off more than he could chew. He's fighting the an opponent in, in Sia Lockett, who, who has only ever lost to Arthur Abraham and Andre Terrell fighting for world titles. And I believe, in my opinion, I think Callum won every round. Won close round, but there was no argument really for, for Sia Lockett to get the rounds. I, I think he, he, he won the fight dominantly under a lot of pressure from what happened with, with obviously Minan the, the week earlier. You know, anyone else could have pulled out, but he stuck at it and, and he was fine. James Aguirre was frightening. I thought he was very good. I thought when that show got made, Groves and Gale, they're on a collision course, they've boxed before, they can't stand each other, everything else. You'd expect Groves to have shone the way De Gale did and stopped that opponent, and you'd have expected Chunky to be in for a long night against a tough Joel opponent, and the roles were reversed in my opinion. And De Gale really stood out and really shone, and, and getting the stoppage against a tough Joel opponent like Pedaban, that was a bit of a statement, but he also made the statement in his last fight as well, and he stood out twice, now two fights on him. Certainly looked good, didn't he? For a round up now, the uh, other international news, back over to you, Ed. Well, the weekend just gone over in Macau hosted World Championship Boxing and Manny Pacquiao looked sharp beating Chris Algieri in defence of his welterweight belt. Algieri was the light welterweight champion and the match made at catchweight. It went 12 but Algieri was dropped multiple times and lucky to go the distance, eventually losing a landslide decision and his title will be declared vacant now as well. Looks as good as ever, doesn't he? Well, Vasyl Lemachenko defended his featherweight title on the undercard and Chinese Olympic star Zhu Shiming stayed unbeaten. This weekend, the attention internationally turns to the lightweight division as Nebraska's Terence Crawford defends at home against another former Ricky Burns opponent in tough contender Raimundo Beltram. We sparred a couple of new guys, you know, that come straight forward, pressure a lot, you know, because we know that's what he liked to do. but. As far as game plan, you know, you're going to see that Saturday. I'm just excited and, and grateful we got, you know, for this uh, uh, other opportunity to fight a great great fighter like as a uh, Terrence Crawford, you know. He got something to prove, I got something to prove, and that makes a good fight. He's the number one guy in the division, so, so it's nothing better to, than fight the best. Well, America struggled of late in amateur boxing, but received a boost in Jeju South Korea with Clarissa Shields and Marlon Esparza both striking gold in the Women's World Amateur Championship. Team GB had two silver medalists in Lisa Whiteside and Sandy Ryan, but the star of the show was undeniably Ireland's Katie Taylor winning her fifth world crown. Here's John Denon from Boxing News, who is ringside. So, John, was Katie Taylor the star of the show? Yeah, she kind of, she always is. It is remarkable that she's won all these tournaments, because like, it's not just for the five world championships, which is amazing in itself, but six, I think, European titles, and that's that's a lot of major tournaments to, uh, you know, to be fit and healthy to compete in, let alone to win them all. 
it seems like it was a very good tournament for America with Clarissa Shields and Marlon Esparza, but also for Team GB. Yeah, yeah, very much so, because, um, you know, it could have been tough for, for Team GB, like Nicola Adams was out recovering from an injury, Natasha Jonas, another Olympian, wasn't there, but they're, they're substitutes, really. Uh, Lisa Whiteside went all the way to the final and gave and gave Esparza, you know, all she could handle. Very, very close that one. And Sandy Ryan, who uh, you know, young, 21, I think, you know, can box at lightweight, the Olympic weight, but was boxing um, at light welterweight, so was coming in a little bit light. Went all the way to the final as well, and you know, came up against a Russian opponent. He just had a number on the day, but you know, Ryan is one to definitely look out look out for in the future, especially if she could, you know, she could be popping up at 60 kilos, Katie Taylor's division, you know, maybe over the next couple of years. I think the success of Whiteside and Ryan will give the selectors real headaches when Nicola Adams and Natasha Jonas are no longer injured, but good headaches to have, Adam. Absolutely, of course they are. Our attention moves to the uh, weekend bill in East London after the break as we analyse the fascinating clashes between Billy Joe Saunders and Chris Eubank at middleweight and the heavyweight dust-up as Tyson Fury renews hostilities with Derek Chisora. Oh, well with Johnny and I, all four of us looking forward to Frank Warren's Excel Bill and Ed brings us all the latest news. Well, lots of debate and divided opinions about this weekend's exciting middleweight clash between Billy Joe Saunders and Chris Eubank Jr. They were scheduled to appear together at a press conference in London today, but both were a no-show due to finally go head-to-head -head at Friday's weigh-in. However, the nominal main event fighters were there at the Imperial War Museum, although Derek Chisora walked out without conducting interviews straight after the head-to-head. -head. Tyson Fury and promoter Frank Warren did stay behind to talk up the heavyweight clash. I feel good, you know, I feel um, very ambitious. I've got my hunger back and um, feeling ready for the fight, feeling really ready. We're in the Imperial War Museum and I think on Saturday night you're actually going to see a heavyweight war. I really do think so. So much at stake. You can expect a super sexy Tyson Fury. His beard is really doing me wonders, you know, I feel like a grizzly animal, the handsome rogue that I've always been. And I think it brings it more out, more out of me every day. The longer it gets, the better for me. And that's what you're going to see. A handsome prince in the ring, moving around elegantly. Winner definitely gets a crack at um, Vladimir Klitschko. Been decreed by the WBO that after March he has to fight the winner of this. And I believe this will be the second time I'm having that long style belt around my waist. So one more time and I can give it to my son, can't I? So I'd like to defend it uh, one more time, maybe win it again. But you know... One fight at a time, like I said, this is the fight that's in hand, and this is the fight that I'm concentrating on at the moment. No glitch goes, no nobodies in my mind at the minute, just Derek Chisora. I'm not interested in the belts, anything like that. I'm only interested in taking punishment out on Derek's face. I've trained harder for this fight than I have done for many of my other fights. For the reason being, I've been in camp for such a long time now, and all the anger that I've had through all the pullouts over the uh, last 18 months is all being channeled into this fight. This, to me, is strictly business. You know, this ain't a personal issue between me and Derek. This is strictly business. Um, going in there to work him out nice and easy, play with him, and uh, get out there victorious and then go on. There's a really good undercard to that Excel bill as well. British champion Gary Sykes taking on Liam Walsh could steal the show at Super Featherweight. It's um, the biggest fight in my career, as every fight is, because you lose and you, you get put right back down the queue. So yeah, it's a huge fight. Um, really excited. You look at the you look at the um, betting odds. So I'm being told it's not something I do, but so I'm being told I'm I'm quite a heavy favourite. But I find that I find that um, surprising. Really, I think. Um, you, you, you look at what Gary's achieved and he's been about a long time, Gary, and I think he's underrated. I think um, it's a very good fight. I think it's a very good fight. I, I haven't got any visions past this fight. I must win this fight and um, afterwards then we'll speak to Frank and go from there. But it's, I can't, I, I'm, not, I'm not naive or ignorant enough to look past him. No way. And there's also a fascinating match at welterweight, pitting the popular unbeaten Bradley Skeet against slick southpaw Frankie Gavin. No, I've heard a lot about him. I've sparred him a lot as an amateur. I know all there is to know about him, really. Look at him, he's, he don't bring nothing different to the table from what I've seen. Uh, he's a basic fighter, but he's good at what he does. 
So as long as I'm on my game, do what I do, I'll see a comfortable win. It's the, it's the biggest and toughest fight in my career so far, but uh, it's one I'm, I'm looking forward to and it's one I'm looking to step up to and show people what I'm all about. I'm not looking at him as a step back. He's not as good as Bundu. Let's not be stupid and say he is, but in the day he's a fighter and he's going he's gonna to come to win. He's undefeated, so he's got a, he wants to keep his own. Well, uh, my, my game is to get rid of that. It's about getting the right fights at the right time, and this, this is the right fight for my career at this time. Uh, I want to be world champion. Nothing's changed, and nothing's going to derail that. Dean Powell, for to me, it was just over a year ago, and uh, he, he seen something then that he wanted me to fight him then. And, uh, but I, like, he, he was the one who always used to tell me, have the right fights at the right time, and uh, it wasn't the right time for me then. And, and I spoke to, to Al, my trainer, and that, and it wasn't the right time. I'm not ashamed to say that. And, but it's the right time now, mandatory now. I want this fight. I could have gone other routes to Commonwealth belt, what he, which he lost to Bondu, become vacant. I could have took that route and boxed for the vacant title. I could have defended my WBA in the Continental title. But I've become mandatory for the British title, and that's what the fight I wanted. So that's the one I took. Plenty to look forward to there, and I'm backing Billy Joe Saunders and Fury on points, Adam. And you haven't been doing too badly lately. You've been getting the I, predictions I, well. I disagree with the last one, but hey, we'll see. We'll find out. Let's talk heavyweights. Uh, Dave, I'll go to you first. Is this fight going to be as easy for Tyson Fury as he makes out it's going to be? Maybe not as easy as what he makes out it to be, <laughs> but I do think Fury's going to take him to bits. Um, Chisora's going to keep plodding after him, but do you know what? I've, I've seen up close how fit he is. You know, I've been up to the gym um, when we had Tony up there, sparring with Eddie Chambers. The man looks in great shape, especially if I've ever seen him. And I saw him at the press conference today, um, or the VT. He looks trim, everything about him. He, he, he's in good nick. He took this really seriously. He needs a big performance, doesn't he? He's so close now to, to the likes of, of Vladimir Klitschko and, and so forth, maybe next year. He, he, he can make no mistake here. He needs a fight. Yeah. He's, he's just yeah. about to fall through on him. Yeah. I, I really feel sorry for him. You know, then two massive fights or three with, with Hay. Yeah. You know, they're big camps as well. And we know Tyson, we know what he's like, we know his attitude. He won't have spared any expense whatsoever. But I agree with Dave and I've seen Tyson in training myself. I've seen him when he when he's he pops into our gym now and then to watch his cousin Jose Burton and, and he's in great shape. He's in really good shape. He's slim, he's trim, he's in good nick and that's good news, though. Yeah, as I say it himself, he's going to be up for it. But let's not write off Dope Chisora. He no looked way. a lot trimmer in yeah. a lot better condition yeah. as, uh, now than he did the first fight. Good yeah. catch. <laughs> Chisora, <laughs> Chisora's in better shape than he ever has been. And I know Chisora with his diet, I'm on the same food. And I know what he eats, I know how he eats, and I know how, he, how he's looking. And he's getting better every single fight, appearance-wise. But appearance. he's going to need every bit of strength he can get because he hasn't got the, the tools and the attributes and the height and everything else and the presence that Tyson Fury's got and I, th I think Fury's just going to use his height, his range. Like he did before? Out. Yeah, it just out, but, but this but time better. around, I don't better. This I think, time, I think yeah. he's, in, he's, in, he's in great shape. The two kids that you look at, Fury back then, Fury now, is in so much better shape and also is that bit more experienced as well? Let's open it up. Mm. Anthony Joshua sizzled last weekend. David Price back on December the 6th. Mm. David Hay, who knows, coming back at some point we think fabulous, isn't it? Oh, it is. In, in, you know, potentially in, in, in 12 months' time, heavyweight division is going to be really exciting in this country, but you've got to think about where you're at right now. People are getting, you know, talking about Anthony Joshua fighting him, him, him. Mm. You know, he's, he's a bit away off before he fights people like Tyson Fury now. David Price? Is he how way off is he with David Price? If I'm managing him, I, I wouldn't put him in with him next. Just, just because why? 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 why you know, there's no Joshua doing it. everything right mm -hmm. at, at, at this perfect. stage, yeah. at this level. We saw him obliterate Michael Sprott, yeah. but you know, we, we expected that to happen yeah. pretty much. I, I did, but you know. You know what I liked about Michael Spot, the first 30 seconds you thought, well this is what you get with Michael Spot, he's going to go out on a shield, yeah, yeah, right. he's going to give him a good go and he will go out on a shield, and he did for the first 30 seconds, but once the spear, you played him before, if I was his matchmaker, which I wouldn't want to be, I'd put kids on a round bonus, I'll give you a few quid more if you go past <laughs> another, round, another round, because how are you going to, you just can't get fellas to stand up to him at the minute, but the ones that will stand up to them are also the ones that will test them, your David Prices, your Tyson Fury, Chisora, I don't know about style-wise and 
technique was, but the ones who match his attributes, like the Fiori, Chisora, obviously the Klitschko, the big, they're going to stand up to him, and that's when we'll see the best of Joshua. The big problem for, for Matchroom Adrian is that there's a massive gulf between the guys now and then the guys that are going to test him. And, and as far as fans are concerned, people want to see him in longer fights and seeing him in real fights. Well, Michael Sprott, that's a good fight on paper and at stage of the, you know, you look at how many fights Anthony's had, that's a good fight to go out there and get rid of him in a round. Mm. That's, that's good going, but then the, the, the temptation is to jump too quickly and, and then these guys are a bit more knowledgeable, you know, defence is a bit cuter and they can also punch. Joshua back in January, we wait to see how good he is and how good is this young man. A little while ago, we welcome Chris Eubank Jr. and Senior, of course, onto the ringside set. Over the years, you've known me well. I, I speak uh, with condition. Uh, I'm not one to, to, uh, to bark. Uh, I've seen nothing like this. I mean, you know, we're talking about the real thing um, personified. This is Chris Eubank, new and improved at middleweight and super middleweight. Them all. I've looked at them. Gennady, Golovkin, he beats him now. Christine has probably been to my gym 30 times, mm. maybe, for sparring. Believe me, he's the real deal, without a shadow of a doubt. And Chris's perceptions or words about Junior, you're going to see. He's the real thing. Fascinating. Especially what Adam Booth said then. Listen, Adam's seen him sparring quite often. I mean, I only saw... I think it was for the DL fight, we had him in camp for, uh, for George and, and I saw the sparring there. To, at the beginning, he gave George all the problems that he could handle, but then George turned it on and then, you know, George started being the boss in sparring. But that's, you're going back a few years now. Obviously he's improving, he's, he's, he's been sparring with Froch and people like that. Been, you haven't seen, he's been taking him around everywhere sparring. But fights, it's a big gulf in fights on, on, on who these guys have been fighting. Carl Froch thinks he's very, very good, Paul. You man. Yeah, and listen, these are all educated opinions yeah. on Adam Boo and Carl Froch, the people you respect, and you have, to, you have to respect their opinion and admire it because they know what they're talking about, but I'd like to think I can judge a fight as well, and I've watched him and I do rate him. I think he's a good fighter, I think he does things that are absolutely quality, but I also think he's never been tested by anyone, and he that, hasn't fought him. But, but Paul, that's what they said about Chris Senior when he boxed mm -hmm. Nigel in the first time, yeah, he said he'd never been tested, and all of a sudden, yeah. kaboom, of course, he was on the scene. Ronnie Davis today, in today's boxing news, saying he's better than his dad. You know, he's, he's bound to say that now, obviously, but his dad was a quality fighter, but his dad also did things that were really basic at times, and, and listen, it proves in the pudding, it's fight night, isn't it? Spartan tales could be told all day, and, and we, we've well, all heard so many of, Hang on a minute, what a Billy Joe Saunders, our young boxer of the year at the Boxing Writers mm. Club. He's done everything pretty much right. He's silky, he's a southpaw, he's got the experience. He could win this fairly easily unless Eubank catches him. You see, for me, a lot of this, it's, it's similar to Cleverly and Bellew. A lot of this, riding on this, is emotion. And there's a lot of spite, again, coming from, from um, Billy, towards Eubank and, and he's been very very vocal in the build up to this. He's got to he's got to keep his emotions in check because he's got to be calculated, he's got to be smart because he has got skills, he's a southpaw, he's clever, he's boxed at higher he's level. Good. Mm. But he's very, very good. But if he goes in there trying too hard to put Eubank away. But is you is Eubank exactly. is Eubank a gem? That's that's what we're going to find and, out. And his dad said he's a, the uh, the best thing since Sugar Ray Leonard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen a great tweet yesterday from one of our other fighters saying he's going to beat Golovkin if Golovkin had no arms. And you know, that's a massive statement saying you're going to beat Golovkin. That's an even bigger statement saying you're the best thing since Sugar Lane Leonard. Yeah. But I believe, in my opinion, it comes down to who, who they've all fought and opponents wise. If Billy Joe's been up there and he's yeah. fought great kids and he's beat great kids, he's got his faults. But in my opinion, it's about levels. And I think Billy Joe has already proven that he's levels above Eubank, who is a good fighter. not slagging him off or saying he isn't good. I do rate the kids. He could be a gem, but he could be a diamond in the rough. He needs polishing. Quick pr prediction? Can't be quick. I think, I think Billy Joe, because of, based on the fights that they've had, I think. Good one, isn't it, though? A couple of tributes <laughs> and trips down memory lane ahead, and we round up plenty of uh, exciting and compelling unseen action. Stay with us.
Hello again. Johnny, Paul, Dave and I have recently seen several good fights on a variety of shows, haven't we? But not as many as our intrepid reporter Andy Scott, who wraps up some of that exclusive action. Last weekend, Liverpool's bumper night of action was kicked off by German super middleweight prospect Vincent Feigenbutz. The youngster turned pro at just 16 and arrived with a big punching reputation. Adam Smith and Glenn McCrory called the action from ringside. Here's a crushing puncher who's been generating excitement over in Germany, making his first appearance on British soil. Don't blink here as the fiery Vincent appearance on British soil. Don't blink here as the fiery Vincent Feigen, but uh, doesn't tend to let his opponents hang around too long, at least at this sort of level as he meets the plucky Latvian Oleg Fedotovs, who we've seen uh, here on a few occasions. Feigen, but recently, Glenn, I uh, saw him keel and he can hit. Yes, he's got a good reputation, although he's having a quiet start here, having a, a long look at Fedotovs before he commits himself with a jab and then a, a big right hand. Uppercut swap between the pair. Fedotovs gets a couple in. Decent round this, certainly in terms of action for the fans. This third. Oh, beautiful shot though. Thrown by Feigen, but still Fedotovs taking them. Oh, another uppercut. Just lands, and I think Steve Gray really should be yeah. having a look here. I think we're just getting to the point now where he's just unable to defend himself properly. Bell's about to come to end the seventh. It's all Feigen, but Fedotov's going to be stopped right on the bell. He is. That's sensible from Steve Gray. And Vincent Feigen, but does get another stoppage victory. It took longer. It wasn't pretty, but it was pretty effective. On Matthew Macklin's undercard in Dublin, exciting welterweight Sam Eggington looked to continue his recent run of good form against Frenchman Sebastian Allais. Adam Smith and Jamie Moore were your commentators. It's been a pretty busy 2014 for the strong, fit and decent Midlander Sam Eggington who starts with a nice right hook to the body. Already his sixth fight of the year. We've seen him in prize fighter and in his biggest win so far against Denton Vassell, Jamie, as he appears on a, another big card against the Frenchman Sebastian Allais. Yeah, I've been very impressed, Adam, with what I've seen of him so far. I was ringside for the Vassell performance and he put his shots together lovely, used a nice jab, used his feet well for the distance and let him walk onto shots. Down he goes. And he fell that. Short and sharp. It was a great shot right to the abdomen. Straight out of the middle, solar plexus. He's not, not going to make this, Jamie. And it's ten and out. First round knockout to Sam Eggington. Beautiful little punch on the inside. And that is his seventh knockout. I think he's going to be fighting for the British and, and Commonwealth and European titles sort of middle, late next year. But that's the plan for him. Just keep on learning, keep on learning. And when he's ready, he'll step up for the big title fights. Irishman Patrick Hyland was hoping to set up a Dublin after a, a real stint in America. 28 wins in his 29 fights. Thought as we all did that he'd meet John Simpson here tonight, but the seasoned Scotsman pulled out and in comes the 21-year-old Romanian Oscar Fico at very short notice, who's uh, one ten of 16 and is a lot heavier at 9 10 8 to Highland's 9 3 8 but Highland pretty classy Jamie yeah very good fighter and um, I'm sure he'll be very disappointed that Simpson's pulled out the short notice and Fico looks like he's up against it lovely left hand yeah just walked him onto that one signed it beautifully you can just see you know he's 31 years old now and he, the experience is he's, he's just ebbing out of him you can just see how cool and calm he is still quick isn't it very quick so that was a nice body shot but nearly doubled him in half there as well yep. put the uh, put down on the accelerator combination 
injections to the body, feet go unraveling and blood to the nose. Ireland had the opportunity maybe to force stoppage win number 14 on the slate. He knocks out the gum shield, right? Final bell goes. Big smile from Fico. Tonight I would have I would have beat John Simpson and you know Josh Warren would have been next and he is a good kid, he's on a good run. He's 23, he's young, he's fit, he's energetic and uh, I just want to tear up with him. Belfast cruiserweight Tommy McCarthy recorded the fourth straight stoppage victory of his professional career. Battering southpaw Martin Horak inside two rounds. The 2010 Commonwealth Games silver medalist enhanced his reputation as an exciting prospect and demonstrated his obvious natural power. Not in any rush, but um, I'm not done trying to slow anything down either, so it's just like a paint again, it's when it's ready, it's ready. Probably a good action. Uh, Dave, what stood out for you? I like Sam Higginson. I think it's a great story. I think he's a kid that's come through the hard way with John Pegg. Um, you know, Pegg is up and down the country with every fighter, you know, all different levels. And it's nice that he's got a, he's got a bit of a gem there. But Sam, Sam, he's got the right attitude. He'll go in there and he'll fight anybody at a drop of a hat. You're nodding. I am, and said this at the time, it was great. He's a better fresh year. I remember when he walked in in the MEN on a matchroom show and went to go on the opponent's arena and didn't hear the opponent's dressing room, didn't sorry. Know. He didn't think he had a hotel room and all that because he was used to being the away fighter and he got looked after and he took it with both hands and he's been signed I think up. Barry Hearn quite likes him, doesn't yeah, he? Does, <laughs> but yeah. Eddie always says Barry absolutely loves him and, go and goes on about him and, and good on him. You know, as I said, same with John Pegg, great. It's, it's brilliant that he's got a, a fighter who, as Dave says, is, is a gem and he, he really is. A, He's old on his own and he's, he's looking good. Also at the top of that piece, Feigenberg, they're, they're talking about putting Callan in with him. Uh, is there yeah. interest there? Possibly. Um, I, I met up with him. His trainer come over to me in German and I thought he was just like a German fo boxing fan because they love it over there. But he come over and he said, we're, we're fans of you. We don't like Arthur. We like you. And he said, I'm Vincent's trainer. And as soon as he pointed them out, I remembered them. And I watched him on a night. He's strong. He can punch. Very crude though and, and seemed a bit easy to it. But... You know, it's a fight Callum had taken at to think. I think they're going to look for some some Germans from Saarland to match up against some matching fighters eventually anyway, so could have an undercard soon. They've also brought him over to, to either fight Callum or maybe Rocky Fielding or something like that. I mean, he's, he's certainly, you know, fun to watch. He's crude, oh, but he's, he's got some power. Very much, and as a paying boxing fan, you're going to buy a ticket to watch someone like him over someone who stands off and box. But, you know, a good fighter, in my opinion, will, if he can take what he gives first and foremost, will we'll, we'll find the key to to Vincent Fegan, but, but he is very exciting, and if he catches you, he'll ask questions of you. Do you think he'd, uh, he'd have a chance of catching Callum, Dave? I rate Callum, and it's not just because his brother sat next to me. Um, <laughs> but, no, it's not. I've, I've always rated him. He's a good kid. Um, I think he's, too, he's, he's got too much punch for He's got too much of a brain. Like Paul was saying, that kid's crude, you know. Um, you need somebody in there that's... For a good fight with him, you need somebody in there that's going to be a little bit wild with his punches and, and a little bit open himself, and... Um, I don't think I don't think Callum would be uh, a bit too too worried about this fella. Let's move it to the featherweights. Patrick Highland, we we saw there talking about Josh Warrington. We've got mm. Lee Selby. That's a great division at the moment. It is Warrington for me is a guy that's just again he's just come out of nowhere. He's been boxing on Steve Wood's small old shows and you know away from the TV cameras. Learned his trade, got his opportunity, took it and look at this. This year for him has been absolutely massive and. You know, he's got a great engine on him, he can fight, he's exciting, he's, he's got an absolute phenomenal crowd. You know, he, he ticks a lot of boxes right now and, and you know, next year's going to be interesting to see yeah, how like far him. on he goes. I like him. Uh, some atmosphere at Leeds when he fights mm -hmm. as well absolutely. and it's only going to get better because the more people that go, they've never had a bad night from him. Mm -hmm. He entertains, he puts it on the line and he gives value for money as well. I'd like to see Warrington against Highland and mm. throw Lee Selby and he might fight for a world title <laughs> pretty soon as well. It's great stuff. Now, long-serving Sheffield trainer Brendan Ingle has been involved in more fights and has created more champions than almost everyone on our shores, hasn't he? Yes, he has. Uh, the guy's produced four Commonwealth, 15 British, eight European and four world champions. Top of your head, that's pretty yeah, good. Then, <laughs> Last Friday night, Johnny here was heavily involved organising a major tribute to his trainer who celebrated 50 years in the sport and it was some turnout too. Several hundred family and friends packed the Magna Centre in Rotherham to pay tribute to a man who has given the sport of boxing so much. 
it's better than winning the pools. Unbelievable, the characters here, and I haven't seen someone for quite a while. Brendan Ingle influenced some of the sport's biggest names. I'm here tonight to, to say that I'm a part of the Brendan clan, definitely a part of the Brendan clan. So I'm here in the justification, everything he's done. All you have to do is look around in here. There's five, I think nearly 500 people in here tonight who are paying their respects to Brendan Ingle, and, and that's why I'm here. It was also good to see another Ingle fighter who's bravely battling cancer. Basically, I've been having chemo this week. I've had a tough week, tiring. Um, but I'm, I'm confident I'm going to get through it and battle it. And I'm quite happy, man. I'm happy. And of course, his star pupil will always be our own world champion. People, when he started off, used to say, that's Johnny Nelson. How can you spend time with him? He'd send the glass out to what? Glass out to Me. sleep. Frank one used to say, I close the curtains if he was boxing me out my back garden. I think that was the line. <laughs> yeah, that was Frank. And they say to him, when you become champion, and then they look at him now. When I look on television, and look on Sky and see Johnny Nelson commentating on the fight. He was absolutely, <laughs> I says, well, strange things happen. Come on, you... <laughs> let's sit down. Boys. See you, see you, see you. <laughs> There's a magic between you, isn't there? You know what, he's, the guy's special, and the guys that turned up, it was like the original flag of Benetton in that place. Every colour, creed and fighter was there from past and present, and they just loved to be uh, in, his, in his presence. Apart from Dave Colwell, I'm sure you wanted to be there, but of course you were with Tony the night before his yeah, fight, it was a long I'd, way. I'd, I'd got my ticket from Johnny, and then I think about a week before I realised it was, you know, mm. what, what day it was. Uh, gutted not, not to be there. Listen, I'm a product of that gym, you know, for w whatever you can say, you know, obviously I didn't do great things as a fighter, but... You weren't bad, are you in a few good scraps, I remember. You know, <laughs> I, I, as a kid that walked into that gym, I had no confidence, no nothing, bullied at school, you know, I didn't have a great childhood as such, and walked into that gym looking at guys like him, and I remember right back then, Johnny, uh, Brendan always used to say, Johnny was his greatest achievement, you know, from where he was to where he went to. And you can see how proud he is of it. I'm feeling up. Paul, a so Paul, bad, Paul just a quick line. <laughs> Paul, a quick line as an outsider. Yeah. How do you sum up Brendan Ingle? Um, I've, I've faced one of his fighters in, in Jason Collins, and I was lucky that he wasn't a typical Ingle style because yeah. I, I couldn't have handled the typical Ingle style, to be honest with you, with my style of fighting. But his record speaks for itself. Johnny's just reeled the champions off. You know, my, my trainer today, we try and remember how many titles he's won, but it's not into to what that is so far. And, other trainers, you only have to look. You have to look up to someone like that. You have to try and look at that. And there's your benchmark. That's a that's a top trainer who's won that that many titles. And similar to Phil Martin in Manchester, it's not just those fighters that he had. It's what they're doing now. Yeah. Dave's producing champions now, and other fighters, Ryan Rhodes, mm. will be producing champions as well. Thanks very much to you both. Guests from the Northwest next week. Modern great Ricky Hatton's on set, yes. and he's joined by the uh, recently retired John Murray. Will also be bringing you news of those prize fighters ahead of the lightweights vying for the big cash prize on Saturday, December the 6th. Then, as we said earlier, December the 13th, the return of Amir Khan to Sky. Amir Khan. Well, you can see the huge card exclusively live. Just have a look at it, right? Jamal Charlo, IBF light middleweight title eliminator. Abner Mares, really good quality. Keith Thurman, the big puncher. He wants a shot at Floyd Mayweather. He's in with Leonard Bundu, who, of course, beat our own Frankie Gavin, gave Lee Purdy that terrific fight at the XL as well. And then the top of the bill, Amir Khan against Devon Alexander. Early hours, December the 14th, Sky Sports 1. Well, it was lovely to see uh, Brendan celebrate half a century. Now, on Monday, I want to ask you <laughs> about your big, friendly rival, Glenn McCrory. It was 25 <laughs> years of service to Sky, and it was 25 years since he won the world title. An emotional night for you, uh, sitting it, next to him? Yeah, you know what, he doesn't look a day... 
younger, uh, with that big old beard on him. But you know what? He's <laughs> such a crowd, such old friends that, that were there. We were. It was hard to talk about him because you thought, what can I say, what can't I say? Because he's a lovable rogue. And uh, it was just a really, really good night. And I said there's that magic with you and Brendan. There's that sort of love-hate with you, Glenn, <laughs> because of the fact you never fought. Yeah, we and never we fought. And, he, and, and I thought he's going to bring it up, and I thought you were going to wind him up as well. But it was, uh, it was a, a cracking night, and uh, his family was, were there. And uh, I think he was going to fill up. In fact, he did. I saw him. But I've been away to you. I think he did. The famous children's <laughs> charity, Variety, also <laughs> gave Glenn the prestigious Silver Cross. It was, and he deserved it, a fabulous night. To give me this award for my 25 years since I won the world title and my 25 years as a the boxing pundit. Hey.